brothers and sisters of Christ. I pray all is well with you, and I pray that you're starting your day with the Word of God, ending your day with the Word of God, praying without ceasing. Um, today we're going to talk about the comment section. So I made another comment in the comment section that I wanted to really end up turning into a huge, solid Bible study. So make sure you have your King James Bibles available. But before we get started, I wanted to sing the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul Again. Just one of those hymns that I like because... It's a good hymn, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this Blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul. O Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll, and the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall appear, even so it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. But it's just Christ, when you sing good hymns and you start singing them over and over, you start getting them memorized. I pray it's well with your soul, brothers and sisters of Christ, and you're content with what God has for you. And no matter what this life throws at you, you stay in the Word of God, you stay in prayer. You stay in the Word of God, you stay in prayer. So we're going to get into this. I think I did my printing at 12 instead of 14 like normal. It looks really small. So, but once again, how are you guys doing today, Brother Sis Christ? I pray all is well that uh, through your jobs, you know, through the life that God's giving you, that you're able to stay in the Word of God, stay in prayer, stay out of trouble. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be there if one for another. Love one another. Okay. So, the comment section, repent means to change your mind. I know we've had studies on this before, but we're going to do another study on this. We're going to keep preaching the truth and keeping it fresh in our hearts. And who knows, someone might come along that's never heard this before. Okay. I've said this before. In the old days, the key to, to salvation was the story of Jesus Christ because nobody knew who Jesus Christ was or a Jesus Christ. There was a lot of people that they came, they knew they were sinners, they, they tried to do what's right, they tried to be good people, and they failed miserably, and they were sorry for it. 
We're going to get into that in this study. They were sorry for it. They just didn't know, I, I'm going to hell and I deserve to go to hell. They were already broken. They had that true biblical repentance, which we're going to be talking about. But they didn't know who Jesus Christ was. Now today, a lot of people don't know who the real Jesus Christ is. But they've heard the story of the Jesus of a Jesus Christ, how he, the death, burial, and resurrection. They've heard the story of Jesus Christ. Okay, for the most part, some of them vary, but for the most part, the death, burial, and resurrection. They can learn the story of Jesus Christ. What's keeping a lot of people, preventing a lot of people from truly getting saved and born again? Biblical repentance. Today, the key is, this is the final authority, keep preaching, always preaching that there's a final authority, and it's God through His perfect written word. Secondly, you really got to push repentance. If you want to see people get saved, you've got to push repentance. Okay. But here we have, uh, under Real Repentance, Peter Ruckman, his old black and white video in 1950s I have on my channel. Someone came on the comment section and said, Repent means to change your mind. Now, if you follow this ministry, we've talked about this. I was deceived in this false definition of repentance when it applies to man, when it applies to us, when it applied to me. Repent means to change your mind from unbelief to belief. God, rep God repents more than anyone in the Bible. Uh, can you prove that? Can you prove that? Now, when we get into this definition, I can prove that yes, Okay, when I show you that there's a difference, yes, God's the one that, when it comes to the word repentance, God's the only one that changes his mind when it comes to the word repentance. So yeah, if God does repent uh, as far as changing his mind more than anyone. But does man do it? But he says, God repents more than anyone in the Bible. I thought this dude, talking about Peter Ruckman in the old black and white, was a faith alone in Christ alone, but he seems to be a works salvationist. Now, first we can see that this person has no problem adding to God's Word. And I'm not doing that to be mean. I'm just not, I did the same thing as, when I was a false convert using Bible perversions, faith alone and everything. Faith alone, faith alone. Okay, Chapter and verse where it says faith alone. The only verse in the Bible is in the book of Hebrews where it talks about, has the word faith and the word alone together. And it says works, let's see, faith without works is dead being alone. It's the only time you see faith and the word alone. And we're going to prove that that's not true. There is no faith alone. We're going to prove that through the, I'm sorry, I said the word prove. They don't like to prove it. They like to add to God's word. But I'm not trying to kick this person. Remember, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves is preventure. They should recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. He's been deceived and saying, we can add to this book and we can subtract from this book. Okay. But he's already adding it. Faith alone, Christ alone. Don't get me wrong. The Bible says uh, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. Not Yeshua, not Yahashua, not Jehovah, not all these other names that, you know, Jehovah's actual title for God, but it's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? I do believe that 100%, but I also believe when the Bible says, add thou not to his word. When you say Christ alone, I want the verse that says Christ alone. You say faith alone, I want the verse that says faith alone. I'm a Berean. We all should be Bereans. Okay. When you say something, I'm going to look it up and say chapter and verse. Okay. But he's adding to God's word and does not use any scripture to back up what he's saying. A lot of them don't do that. When they try to come in with these false gospels, they don't back it up with scripture. And the ones that do, they'll read the scriptures as it is, and in their words, they'll add to the scriptures. They'll read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They don't read verse 10, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that before been ordained that we should walk in them to change life after salvation. They skip 10, they just read 8 and 9, and they say, see, faith alone. It never said faith alone. Yes, it does. It says, for every grace, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. It doesn't say that. They have no problem adding to the Word of God. That's not the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, brother, says Christ, when you, when you have people that you want to be saved, and you have people that you want to, they're like, eh. They, 
when they have no problem adding to the Word of God and defend it and defend it and defend it and defend it, I want to treat them like they're lost. Even if my heart says, I, I want to believe they're saved, I'm going to treat them like they're lost. I'm going to go back to the Gospel. You always go back to the first step. Why they got saved, who it is that saved them, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. They've forgotten. If they are truly saved and they're falling away, they've forgotten. They've forgotten who saved them. They've forgotten who they serve. Paul talks about this. I'm getting ahead of myself about uh, they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly. You can be as God's knowing good and evil. Who are they serving? Themselves. When you have people that vehemently add to and subtract from the Word of God and have no problem with it. Have no problem with it. They justify it left and right. So chapter verse where the Word of God says faith alone. What does the Bible actually say? Ephesians 2, we're going to start Ephesians. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to turn to the first one and then we're going to be jumping through a lot. Trying to keep these videos down. Remember you can pause the video and turn as I just read off my notes. Ephesians 2, 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Okay says that in the ages to come he might show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Remember, in every dispensation, I'm a dispensationalist because the Bible says rightly divide, 2 Timothy 2.15, and Paul says the dispensation of the grace that's given to me to you, word, he's talking about there's dispensations. How God dispenses his grace, that's one thing I'm about to say. In every dispensation, God is saving man by his grace. But man has to repent and then follow the instructions that God gives on how to find His grace. Repentance is always there. God's grace is what always saves. But what is mankind trying to do today? They're trying to take repentance out of the way. They're trying to destroy true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. But it's God's grace that saves. Verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. I believe that. But here's the thing, I fear God. I'm not going to stand here and say, well, it's grace alone and add the word alone, through faith alone and add the word alone. Twice. Well, first of all, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. So grace saves, and you find that grace through faith. There's two things there. They're not alone. Why are you throwing in the word alone? Because they have this desire to, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yea, have God said, I can correct it and say it the way I want to say it instead of saying it the way God said it. That's not a Bible believer. I've been talking to some brethren, a whole other uh, study. It's really been bugging me lately. It's like, lately I've been indoctrinated with adding to and subtracting from God's Word. A lot of people have been indoctrinated into adding to and subtracting from God's Word. And I'm trying my best to say it God's way and stand for the way God said it. That's what a Bible believer does. So if you call yourself a Bible believer, do you stand by this book as it is and say it the way God said it? Are you one of these Trinitarians or these people, that theologians, that like to add the word rapture and, and church age and, and it's at the time of the Gentiles? No, church age. It's caught up. No, rapture. It's uh, the uh, kingdom of heaven. Sometimes reference the day of the Lord, kingdom of heaven. No, it's the millennial kingdom. And they come up with this all these terms. They can't say it God's way to save their life. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's a different spirit oftentimes with these theologians. It says here, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It's God's grace that's always saved in every dispensation. And this dispensation, we are justified by faith. There's works on the side that prove our faith, but we're justified by faith. Paul says the just shall live by faith. Through faith. And that not of yourselves, not of yourselves. We've talked about this before. When you say faith alone there, you make it of yourselves. It's you. It's what you're doing that saved you. Yet the Bible, the next part of the verse says, and not of yourselves. It's not faith alone. And I'm going to prove this. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. In other words, the works of the law. In other words, sinless perfection. Trying to earn your way to heaven. So you can't earn your way to heaven through the works of the law, and you can't earn your way to heaven with anything that you do. Even if it's faith, you still didn't earn your way to heaven. It's a gift, lest any man should boast. 
It's a gift of God. For in case you say it, and not, through, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. A gift is something you didn't earn. Someone had to pay for it. Someone had to give it. You didn't earn it. Okay? That's, we talked about this before, you know, when people, they're trying to take prayer out where you don't even ask for salvation. You don't ask God to save you. You just take that gift. No, you have to ask for it. In this case, you have to ask for it. And it has to be given. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. As you can see, there is no word alone here. Why is that? Now, we know they like to insert, and I did too at one time as a false convert. I did insert it a lot. Alone, alone, alone. And I kept saying it so much. And what it is, it's indoctrination. Alone. I had a brother in Christ that uh, he did a study on, did John preach isolation before the catching away of the body of Christ, before we get caught up, before the time of Jacob's trouble? And through that whole study, he kept saying, see, John is isolated. See, John is isolated. He kept saying the word isolated, a, I'm exaggerating, a million times. But the word isolated was never in the scriptures. And anything that he read, the word isolated, the word alone, you know, that he was by himself, wasn't even there in the scriptures. But he kept saying, isolated, isolated, isolated. What is that? It's called indoctrination. He was indoctrinated, and he's passing on the indoctrination. Where if we want the Bible to say something, all we have to do is say, this, say that word we want in there over and over and over, and then somehow we see it. It's there, even though it's not actually written in the text. The word alone is not there. The word isolation was never there. Okay. I got kicked for saying exiled because I got indoctrinated. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. No, he wasn't. He was, past tense, in the Isle of Patmos. So when he's writing that first chapter, which is an opening to everything he wrote at the time when he went through that experience, that first chapter, like a prologue, he was no longer in the island of Patmos. He was somewhere else. But anyway, I, I, but the point is, is they'll say that all the time. They'll read that verse and say, faith alone, faith alone, faith alone. They keep saying alone, alone, alone. It's been, it's been indoctrinated into them that they say it so much, but the Bible never says it. And it's not just with the word alone. For this subject, we're going to get into repentance. It's about all kinds of things in the Bible, all these false teachings and everything. When you actually get someone and say, hey, you have to say it the way God said it, and you have to stand for the way God said it stands for it, 90% of all false teachings go out the window. All the false teachings, false doctrines that come in, they have to add to and subtract from the Word of God. And if you cut that out, they got no leg to stand on. Faith alone. Where does it actually say that? And they get upset when you do that, brothers of Christ. We say chapter and verse on faith alone. I remember them hitting me up because we said trying to use the words that are in the in the use the words that God chose in the Holy Scriptures. They'll come back and say, "Well, Bible's not in the Bible," and I'm like, mm, "Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Bible's in my Bible. Look at that, right there. I think you can see it, maybe. <laughs> Bible's in my Bible. Well, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the actual Holy Scriptures. Okay. I've never once said, "Thus saith the Lord," Bible. Have you noticed that about these people? There's a lots of words I use that aren't in the scriptures. Computer. There's a computer right here. Um, pictures. I don't know if the word pictures in there, but cars, planes, engines. There's a lot of words I use that aren't in the Bible. But when you stand here and you're going to say, and you're a representative, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and you're going to say, thus saith the Lord, it better be in here. And that's our whole point. When I stand here and say the Bible teaches, the Word of God teaches, it better be in here. The Word of God says, it better be in here. This is fundamental doctrine. It better be in here. Or you're a liar. I think I got that verse in here. Add that not to his word lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. All these people, whether they know it or they're ignorant, when they say faith alone, they're liars. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse where it actually says that. Now, as I said here, as you can see, this, there is no word, the word alone here. But they like to insert it. Why? Because they've been taught and indoctrinated to do it. And the enemy has done that because he doesn't want people to truly get saved and born again. 
Why is that? Well, we know why the enemy, you know, doesn't want to see people say, I'm saying, why does this text here not have the word alone? If it's such a fundamental doctrine, it's, it's, the, it's the true plan of salvation. For grace are you saved through faith alone. It should have said the word alone there. Why didn't it? We'll turn to Acts 20, 21. We'll turn to this one real quick. Turn to Acts 20, 21. They don't like this verse. Well, they don't like quoting it hardly ever. Acts 20, 21. It says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. They're not alone. you got to have both. Now, are you calling those people that they'll vehemently defend faith alone? Are you calling Paul a liar? This is at the end of the book of Acts. This is when the transition happened. We're no longer in the early book of Acts where they're under the kingdom of heaven gospel, where they're preaching, repent and be water baptized, wash yourselves clean, cleanse yourselves, repent and turn from your sin. Repent, it's always there in every dispensation, but they're to turn from their sin. Water baptism's there. Water baptism's not here today. Today you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ. In the early book of Acts, the kingdom of heaven gospel was being preached. We're at the very end of Acts, now we're at the gospel that's revealed to the Gentiles. And I'll prove this by the end, because we'll come back to this verse at the end of the study. But you see that there's two things there. Faith isn't by itself. It's not a loan. They cause a contradiction in the Bible every time they say faith alone. They go against this book. They're against the Word of God. Let's see. Which we'll get into this study that true biblical repentance is, is applied to salvation. Okay? We're going to get into true, what true biblical repentance is. Okay? That's the first thing is, is I had to make mention. This guy, he did what I used to do. He adds to the Word of God because he's been indoctrinated by his Babel building and his organized religion, his social club that he's a part of. He's indoctrinated and there's some groups here online that do the same thing. They're indoctrinated to add to the Word of God, subtract from the Word of God. Okay? And I don't even know if this guy... He says, I thought Peter Ruck was safe. He never once in his quote claimed to be a King James Bible believer. That there's a perfect written Word of God and God's the final authority through that perfect written Word of God. He never says that. Okay? Um, but I believe it. I'm a King James Bible believer. This is God's perfect written word. This is the foundation I'm holding him accountable to. This is the foundation that you can hold me accountable to. This is ultimate authority. This is God's perfect written word. But secondly, he's accusing an elder slash preacher teacher of the word, uh, of the word of teachings. In the word, he's teaching works-based salvation without even using scripture. I, I understand that, Brothers of Christ, if you're going to correct someone, that's fine. Correct them through the Scriptures. Remember, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You don't come on here and make a comment like you're trying to cause trouble. Because that comment almost sounded like it caused trouble. Because if he was actually someone who followed Peter Ruckman's ministry, he'd sit there and go, Something just isn't right. I, oh, come on. I, this, is this the right teaching? Or did he make a mistake? You know, something in meekness, like a friend would say to another friend, or a son to a father. You know, it's like, the attitude is just something that someone comes along like he's just, you know, being kind of snarty and just making a comment, though. I thought this dude was a faith alone in Christ alone, but he seems to be a work salvationist. Chapter and verse. He didn't mention any verses whatsoever. He didn't correct the proper way. Like we're going to be doing today. He didn't correct the proper way, brothers says Christ. Brothers says Christ, I see this not as much anymore on my channel because I can't stand the fact that this is where I'm always going to go. Someone comes to correct me and there's times I have been corrected and I have been wrong because they've come to me with this. But the faith alone people don't like to come with me, especially with this because I can easily prove them wrong. It's not faith alone. Um, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by God's grace through faith. Two things. It's not alone. But they love to say it alone, alone, alone. I always go back to this and they can't stand it. And yes, there was times I did kind of mock them a little bit because I'll say, like we just read there in Acts, 
The Acts road to salvation that we read in Romans, the Romans road to salvation is what they'll, the Romans uh, road to hell, I'm sorry, the Acts road to hell is what they'll call it when we start showing them that there's repentance involved. Then in Ro Romans, they love to grab Romans, but we'll grab Romans and say, here's parts in Romans where it shows you have to repent, and they'll be like, well, the Romans road to hell. Then in 1st and 2nd uh, Corinthians, oh, the Corinthians road to hell. They don't want repentance as it applies to salvation. It's just that simple. They have a problem with God. They have a problem with this book. They still love their sin. I got correct on this with the Old Testament and Psalms. The reason God won't hear someone's prayer is that if you regard iniquity, I kept saying holding iniquity, regard iniquity in your heart. Regard means that when you hold someone in high regard, you're choosing that person over this. You're choosing your sins over God. You can never get saved that way. But with this faith alone, false gospel, no repentance, you can regard iniquity in your heart and just say you believe in the big guy upstairs. You have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you've been deceived into thinking you're going to heaven when you die. You're not. Okay. He doesn't use scripture. When you go to correct someone, you use scripture. That brother corrected me. It's not hold iniquity in my heart. It's, it's regard iniquity. Because there's, there's a little slight difference. But more importantly, the number one difference is, is one's in here, the other is not. And that's a big difference to me. That's supposed to be a big difference to the Bible believer. You might think, well, hold iniquity in your heart. Regard. It's kind of the same thing. Are you a Bible believer? I'm a Bible believer. I took the correction. This man just made a quick a snipe statement and didn't back it with any scripture. He didn't try to reach the person in the video. That always bothers me too, brothers of Christ. They never try to reach. Some of them will just snipe me too in my comments under my own videos. And they never try to reach me for the truth through the Word of God. They never do. Mm -hmm. So that kind of bothered me a little bit too. Without even using Scripture, yet again, to correct him and get back in line with the Word of God. That's the whole point. When you, when you even open your mouth to correct anybody, the true reason to correct them, when someone has their heart in the right place, is to see them getting back in line with the Word of God. Get them back to doing what's right. To see them not make that mistake again. Then you have those people that like to correct people just to correct people to show how like great they are, or they love putting people down. Because they correct in the way that they're just trying to destroy you. They don't want to see you get up and doing what's right. They just like to keep pointing out what you did wrong. and want the whole world to see it, and they like to you know, just make you wallow in what you did wrong. No, we correct people to get them back into a standing position, to get them back in their walk with the Lord. And we do it through the Scriptures. It's called exhortation. Correction and exhortation, okay. which is what we are going to do with this person today. We're going to go through the step Bible and we're going to do a solid Bible study. Turn to Numbers 23, 19. Now he just talked about there, he said, uh, repentance is just a change of your mind from unbelief to belief. Now we've already disproved this, but we're going to do it again and we're going to do it in a little bit more detail. God rep uh, repents more than anyone in the Bible. Okay. He does repent in the Bible. But here's the problem that I failed because I never did a solid Bible study on it. I bet you this person here has never done a word study on the word repent. Repentance. Anything that has to do with repent. So there's re repent, repenting, repentance, repented, ED, all those words and find what the Bible. You can go through the Webster's 1828 dictionary. I got it up here just in case. But we need to go through the Bible and find out what the Bible teaches. How the word's used, what the Bible says repentance is. Repentance has two definitions in the Bible. It does. We're going to get through that. So when God repents, what's that like? Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Wait a second. I know we're going to get into this. I know there's verses where it says God repents, but here it says, Neither is the Son of Man that he should repent. This isn't a contradiction. He's not saying that God never repents. He's saying he doesn't do it the way the Son of Man does. 
When man repents, it's not the same thing as when God repents. It's two different repentance. Why? Because and yet, in Genesis 6-5, pause the video, turn to Genesis 6-5, reread, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Remember, that's on his heart. We're going to find out later that when man repents, it's because of what's on your heart. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. He repented? God repented? Wait a minute. Over here it said God didn't repent. No, he said it's not that he's not the son of man that he should repent. He doesn't repent the same way mankind does. God doesn't make mistakes. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. He changed his mind. He's like, I, I, I made them, but now he's changing his mind saying, okay, I'm going to wipe them off the earth. And you read the whole story about Noah. But it says there that God repented. And yet in Numbers 23, 19, we read, Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. So we learn here that when God repents, it's not the same way man repents. Yet that comment that that person made in the comment section, he's trying to bring us up on God's level and saying we repent the same way God does. Yet the Bible clearly says he's wrong. When man repents, it's not the same way God repents. Yet you'll get this indoctrination where repentance is just going from unbelief to belief, unbelief to belief. It's just a change of mind, change of mind. They say it a million times, indoctrinating themselves. If they actually sat down and did a solid Bible study, they'd find out that's not true. But it takes time to labor in the Word. A lot of people don't like laboring in the Word. As a Bible believer, God's Word is perfect. We do not need to change it to understand it. Some, you don't have to turn here, but some words about that. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. We're not to add to God's word. I got in trouble with, with a woman professing to be a Christian, and she kept, kept saying that Jesus is her best friend and everything, and, and you make him out to be like a dictator and, the, and everything. It's like, I don't have to keep his commandments. We're, we're friends. And I'm like, the whole Bible is, is, is give his commands. Jesus is capital K, king of lowercase king, capital L, lord of lowercase lord. He's a master. He's, he's God manifest in the flesh. The image of God, the flesh of God. He's creator of all things. He's God Almighty. When he says something that says this is the way to do it, you're to do it. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Once again, that always goes back to why these people really love faith alone. Because they did something themselves. They've earned salvation with something they did. They can just take salvation and then do whatever they want. They don't have to obey God. Repentance starts with I'm getting ahead of myself, is that you learn what God says is right, and you look at your life and say, I failed miserably. And you have sorrow for it. It comes down to God's commands. Mm -hmm. uh, Proverbs 36 says, Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. That's Proverbs 30, chapter 30, verse 6. Lest you found a liar. If I say something when I comes to, I can say a lot of things, but if I say, thus saith the Lord, the Bible teaches, the Word of God teaches, the Holy Scriptures say, this is, this is major doctrine, it better be in here. And if it's not, you correct me. And if I won't take the correction, I am now a liar. These people that won't take the correction and keep saying faith alone, they're liars. And they've been proven to be liars. We don't need to change God's Word, because that's the, that's the M.O. of the world. That's what they do. When they find something they don't like, or something they don't understand, because remember this is a spiritually discerned book, something they don't understand, they'll start adding to it and subtracting from it. They'll start messing it up. That's what they do. Is that what a Bible believer does? We need to follow 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. One verse says that he's not the son of man that he should repent. Another verse says God repented. What's the difference? It's not a contradiction. 
Okay, I've already explained what it is. One says when Son of Man repents, it distinguishes that repentance is what man does, and God doesn't do the way man does. Whereas when God repents, it's not the same way we do it. Okay? I think I was talking to a brother in Christ. It's like, nowhere do we ever say that I was going to go out and wash the car today, but it repented me, and I end up working in the garden instead. We don't talk like that. We go, I was going to wash the car, but changed my mind, and I went out and walked in the garden. I never used the word repentance for mankind changing their mind. And I, I've done the study. I've never seen it when it comes to mankind changing their mind. I mean, watch out for the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I think it tried to grab uh, when the uh, Jews came out of Egypt. He said he didn't want them going after a certain group because it might repent them and they might turn back to Egypt and repent. They try to say, see that? It's a change of mind. No, it's a change of heart. Egypt's a type of the world. They're called out of Egypt. They're supposed to be heading to the promised land. They're supposed to be trusting God and having faith in God. And their faith keeps wavering and they have a change of heart and they want to go back to Egypt. I don't always go off the Webster's 1828 Dictionary because it's not always true. But here's the thing. We're talking about salvation here. Repentance as it applies to salvation. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. If you do a word study on repent slash repenteth slash repentance, you will find that there are two definitions, both two definitions, both still have to do with mankind sinning against God, though. We're going to look into this. Both have to do with God, uh, mankind sinning against God. When God repents, it still has to do with mankind being in error. When man repents, it still has to do with us being in error, being in sin. Okay? When God repents, it's a change of mind based on man's repentance to God or man's disobedience towards God. In other words, mankind's sinning against God. 1 Samuel 15.11. Turn to 1 Samuel 15.11. We're going to see an example of this. Okay? Now Samuel... He, the people wanted a king like everyone else. They rejected God as their king. And they wanted a king just like everyone else of themselves. So God raised up Saul to be king. Now Saul, he failed the Lord. We've talked about this in other studies. He sinned against God. And this is where we're at right here. 1511. It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king. In other words, God's changing his mind. I don't want Saul to be king anymore. Why? For he turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. He sinned against God. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. It repented him. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 13, you go back a few chapters, it says, and, Saul, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. What's this repentance here? I made you king. I'm going to change. I, ch I changed my mind. You're no longer going to be king. I'm going to give it to King David. And why? Because he sinned against him. He did wrong by the Lord. That's why that change of mind was there. God doesn't just sit there and change his mind just to change his mind. It's always connected to mankind failing him or, six, or, or repenting. They failed him, repented, and then God will change his mind when it comes to his punishment, what he planned to do. Mm -hmm. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, before the sin. But now the, thy kingdom shall not continue after the sin is a change in what the Lord said he would do. It's a change of mind, but what the Lord said he was going to do. When God repents, it's a change of mind, and there's always sin or the warning of sin present. What this person has been taught is to bring mankind up to God's level. So our repentance is the same as God's, but we read the verse there where it says, the son, he's not the, neither the son of man that he should repent. God is not the son of man that he should repent. When God repents, it's not the same repentance as mankind. Yet Satan, through indoctrination, has got people to raise up mankind and make mankind equal to God. Well, when we repent, it's the same as God repenting. No, it isn't. Genesis 3.5 says, 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It's always been that temptation, it's always been that push that God's not the final authority, man is. You can be the final authority. You can play the yea hath God said, a better rendering would be game. And you can add to this book and subtract from this book as you see fit. Ye can be as gods. When you make true biblical repentance for mankind as it applies to salvation, the same as when God repents, you're trying to elevate man to be like God. To be on God's level. We're not on God's level. Mm -hmm. When God says He's going to do something, He doesn't lie. It's going to happen. So when He repents, it's not that He's lying. He's saying, I changed my mind. Just like He did with Saul. Okay. Now, there's times, like I said, we, I did stop right there. There's a lot of examples in the Bible where there's times where God said, this, something bad's going to happen to this person. Especially uh, Nineveh. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to those people. And the king puts on sackcloth. All the people put on sackcloth. And it, he, he changed his mind. He didn't destroy Nineveh in 40 days. Right? There's a lot of times where God said, this is going to happen to you. And then the person falls down on his knees before God rents his clothes, humbles himself, repentance. He has sorrow in his heart for that sin he did wrong that now he's, there's judgment upon him. There's punishment upon him. And he has sorrow, and God looks at the heart and goes, you know what, it repented me. I'm not going to have that bad thing happen to you that I said was going to happen to you. I changed my mind and how I'm going to treat this, how I'm going to handle this, based off of man's sin. Now you can go through here and you can try to fight my one. That's not the argument. They don't fight that. The thing is, is they're trying, what they're saying is, is when man repents, it's the same way. And it's not. Okay. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, we read, that's so where we get to 2 Corinthians 7, 9. The Corinthians rode to hell. If it would just said faith by itself, had the word faith in the, chapter, in the verse by itself, they'll say, Corinthians rode to heaven. But the moment you point out a verse that has repentance in it, the Corinthians rode to hell. What is this? It's a different spirit. I don't believe these people that are vehemently doing that, especially the ones claiming to be in ministry, where it's on YouTube or in these battle buildings, they're not saved. They're hirelings. Okay? They're servants of Satan. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Why did he say that you were just, just being sorry? But that you sorrowed to repentance. Sorry? Uh, uh, we'll get into, I'm getting ahead of myself. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. You're not just sorry for the consequences down here of your actions. You're sorry towards God. Regardless of the consequences, you're sorry for what you for sinning against God, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. For godly sorrow, that's why he said, but but the sorrows of the world worketh death. I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry. The sorrows of the world worketh death. I'm just sorry for the consequences. If there was no consequences there, I, I'm not sorry for the action. I'm not sorry for the sin. I'm not sorry for the bad deed. I'm just sorry I got caught. I'm sorry for the consequences. That's worldly sorrow. He's like, I, I'm not saying I want you to be that kind of sorry. I want you to have godly sorrow. Right here it says, we're made sorry after a godly manner. Sor for godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow. Sorrow towards God. For what? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. The law of sin and death. I've sinned, therefore my punishment is I go to hell and burn for all eternity. That punishment hasn't been executed yet. It hasn't happened yet. But that's where, before I got saved, before you got saved, brother and sister Christ, and if you're lost, that's where you're heading. If you're saved, that's where we were heading before we got saved. Okay? That sorrow towards God for your sins. I always say your personal sins. What I mean by personal sins is you go to the cross throwing your sins on there saying, this is how wicked I am. Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. He didn't go on there saying, 
the world's a sinner, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. When he got saved, he went there personally and, and spiritually to the cross and said, this is the wicked man that I am. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The law of sin and death. Who shall deliver me? Oh, wretched man, I am the chiefest of sinners. When I say you go to the cross with your personal sins, I'm not saying you have to be able to know every sin you commit. Because I was talking to a sister in Christ about this where when I first got saved, I knew I was a sinner. And I had sorrow for that sin. That was the key that led me to salvation. It was the key that led the sister of Christ to salvation. I knew about Jesus Christ. I had the head knowledge of Jesus Christ. I didn't know what true biblical repentance was. And after God saved me, I got the Holy Spirit and I started studying the Word of God and listening to the Word of God. I looked at my life and I realized I, my life was like two, three, four, five times worse than I thought it was. And I was like, Lord, you got a lot of cleaning up to do. We got a lot of cleaning up to do because I got to submit myself to you, Lord, and your Word. We got a lot of cleaning up to do looking at my life when I first got saved. So you might not go to the cross throwing every iniquity in your cross. I didn't say that. It said throwing yourself, saying, This is how wicked I am. Because you know how wicked you are when you get saved. You know it. You remember the story of uh, the woman that was, I think she was a harlot, and she came in and the publican, he's eating at the publican's house, she came in, fell at his feet, was crying, washing his feet with tears, and the publican says, if this man was truly a holy man, you know, uh, a man of God, he would know what kind of woman this is, for she is a sinner. Don't fall for this lie that you can't know that you're a sinner until after you get saved. That's a lie. That's a total lie. You have to be, know that you're a sinner and you have to have sorrow for said sin before you go to the cross. Okay? You have to repent before you go to the cross to get saved. And today repentance is being destroyed and being done away with. Okay? Godly sorrow, another way to say it is sorrow towards sin. But for what? We did that. Uh, Romans 3.23, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 7.24 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7.24. Look at this. Romans road to hell that they claim. Romans road to hell. No, it's the Romans road to salvation. God... Paul talks about salvation at the end of the book of Acts. He talks about salvation in Romans. He talks about salvation in 1 and 2 Corinthians. He throws in salvation in almost all the Pauline epistles. Okay? When they hear something they don't like, it automatically becomes the set book, such and such book, road to hell. Why? Because they don't want the truth. They have never come to God broken and have a 100% desire of the truth. To be told the truth. They hate the truth. Luke 18, 13 says, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much of his eyes into heaven, but smote unto his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee over there was comparing himself to everyone else. Oh, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, but I'm just not as bad as this person over here. You, you see this a lot with the easy believings that I was raised in, and the battle building system I was raised in. It was all that we're all sinners. The Bible says we're supposed to confess our faults one to another. They don't even do that. We're not supposed to confess our specific sins one to another. We're supposed to confess our sins to God and repent every day. I've got to ask God for forgiveness every day after salvation. Repentance starts before salvation and it continues until God calls us home. And we get our new bodies, our incorruptible bodies. This corruption must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. Then we brought to St. Bear that grave wears thy victory uh, death wears thy sting. The strength of, of, of the law of, of sin is the law. It goes back to talking about the law, talking about sin. Sin no more has dominion over us. When we get our new bodies and everything and we go up. But right now I'm still having to apologize to the Lord and, for, and ask for forgiveness for my sins. Mm -hmm. But that publican wouldn't even look up and he only talked about himself. He didn't compare himself to the Pharisee. He didn't compare himself to the world. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you've never come to the cross that way, you're not saved. You're not saved. You just have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
Now here's where the proof that when men's, man's repent is not the same as when God repents. When God repents, it's a change of mind, remember? We talked about this. We've proven it. They don't argue this part. Yes, when God changes, it's a re repents, it's a change of mind. But when man repents, it's the same thing. Uh, turn to Nehemiah 2.1. Nehemiah 2.1. We're going to go to the Old Testament, <laughs> the might of prophets. Nehemiah 2.1. And it came to pass in the month, well, Nehemiah, you have Ezra, they, re, they come back to the land and rebuild the temple. And Nehemiah, they rebuild the, um, the walls and the gates because it's important for prophecy, for Jesus to come through with the, on the donkey and ride into the city. Okay, So it's not the minor prophets. It's before that. But it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. His countenance changed. Sorrow of the heart. Then I was sore afraid. You say, what does this have to do with repentance? Hold on here. Sorrow of heart. Turn to Psalms 13, 12, 2. Psalms 13, 2. And that sorrow of heart was... The city's destroyed, the gates are destroyed of his home city. He repented in his heart, he had sorrow in his heart for what Israel did that sent them into exile. And now look at the state of Israel versus how it was when he was in heart was right with God versus their Israel's heart not right with God. Okay? But he had sorrow of heart. Psalms 13, 2. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me, having sorrow in my heart daily? Hmm. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes 11.10. I'm really trying to push this sorrow of the heart. Well, and you'll find out why. Ecclesiastes 11.10. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Hmm. Removing sorrow of the heart is linked to putting away evil from the flesh. For Nehemiah to put uh, um, that sorrow away from his heart, he had to go make something right. That's wrong. What's wrong? The gates are destroyed. He had to go and make it right. To get rid of that sorrow in the heart. Now, can we earn salvation? No. But how do we get that sorrow to disappear in our heart we come to God repenting and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That God's blood was shed on the cross and it washes my sins away. In other words, if you do not sin against God, then you should not have sorrow in your heart towards God. Towards God. Now we're getting back to towards God. Okay. Proverbs 15, 13 says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So we talked about a sorrow of the heart, something that happens in the heart. If you want to put sorrow away from the heart, you got to make right which is wrong. Whatever's wrong has got to be made right. So that sorrow can be put away. Now we see that by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And you look at Nehemiah, the, the king looked at him, could see him and said, this is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. The man was broken. Now, I've not before time been sad in his presence. He could see a change. Something's wrong. He's sorry, sorry about something. That's the same thing about someone who comes to salvation. That change starts at salvation, before salvation, that repentance. A change of heart. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but sorrow of the heart is the spirit broken. What would you read in 2 Corinthians 7.10? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. For godly sorrow, the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken in Proverbs 15, 13. Turn to Psalms 34, 18. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save such that be of a contrite spirit. A broken spirit? A broken heart? A contrite spirit? What we read in Proverbs 15, 13, but the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And in Psalms 34, 18, God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart. And 
then going in to save as such. Save as such that be of a contrite spirit. Once they have a broken heart, they're in a position where God's willing to save them, and they're ready to be saved. In the Old Testament, when God changed his mind, it's because man repented. Man had a change of heart. They repented towards God, and God had a change of mind and forgave them. Or they had a change of heart from doing what was right to going back to, do, to, going to doing what's wrong, like King Saul. Because if you look at him early on, he did what was right by the Lord early on. But he got messed up by the world and trying to please man. You know, uh, a friend of the world. Trying to please the world over pleasing God. You know, the adulterers and the adulteresses know you not that friendship of the world is enemy with God. Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's what Saul did. He was too busy trying to please the people over pleasing God. And he lost his way. He had a change of heart in the wrong direction. So we see that when man repents, it's having sorrow and heart for sinning against God. Psalms 38, 17 says, For I am ready to halt. Sorry, Psalms 38, 17. You can pause the video and turn. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. This is King David. For I will declare mine iniquity, and I will be sorry for my sin. That's true biblical repentance. You fear God. You realize that, hey, because I've sinned against Almighty God who created me, and the punishment of sin, you realize the punishment of sin is hell. I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. And that change of heart happens. I'm sorry for it, Lord. I'm so sorry for sinning against you. I wish I'd never sinned against you, but I did. And, and I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, but I deserve to go to hell. And Lord, I'm so sorry. Is there no nothing I can is there nothing that can be done? Is there no way out of hell? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I made a way for you to get saved. It's the cross, what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And you go to the cross with that broken heart and that contrite spirit. And I've always said this before, when you actually look at the cross, when true biblical repentance, like I did, and a lot of the brothers and sisters in Christ that are watching this today. We go to the cross, and that sorrow got magnified. It got, not magnified, it amplified. That sorrow increased. I want to make sure I'm using the right word. It increased. He who did that because of my sins. Those, that's what I did. I was the one that did it. I was the one that was wrong. I'm the one that deserves to go through what he's going through. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. And that's when, you know... Repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. You confess both your repentance and your belief to God in prayer, and you ask God to save you, to change life afterwards. That's why you see these people with the changed life. They're living for Jesus Christ with all their heart. Sanctification. They're living a clean and holy life according to God's Word, not the world. Some still backpedal. It's a whole other discussion. But that's what true biblical repentance is. Best definition of repentance as it applies to finding God's grace. Someone in this state, in this state, is ready for salvation. Someone in this state, however, turn to Philippians three seventeen. These are the this is the faith alone people. Three Philippians three seventeen. The faith alone false gospel people. This is them. There's no they they defend their sin to the death. They regard iniquity in their heart. They regard that sin over God. And they refuse to repent. True biblical repentance. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction. Okay, They're still heading for hell in other words. Their end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. They're not sorrow towards God. They're their own God. They decide what's right and wrong. They refuse to repent. Here it is. And whose glory is in their shame. They're regarding iniquity in their heart. They love their sin. They have no problem with their sin. They're glorying in their shame. Who mind earthly things. Carnally minded walking after the flesh. First, uh, Romans chapter 8. 
Paul's talking about two types of people. Someone who's saved and born again and someone who's lost. Someone who's saved and born again is under the law of God, the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And they're capital S spiritually minded and they're walking after the capital S spirit. God's opening this book to them and telling them, do this, don't do that. Do that. You see the changed life. A false convert that someone just has a profession of faith, mainly with the faith alone people, all of them, the carnally minded and walking after the flesh. They're still under the law of sin and death, whose end is destruction. They're still under the law of sin and death. They're carnally minded, walking after the flesh, whose God is their belly, the belly, the flesh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. What's the problem? They've never truly repented and come to the cross in that repented state, that broken and contrite state. They've never come to the cross like that. They're one of those people that pass by the cross and look at it and go, yeah, yeah, I, I believe that happened. And they keep walking. They have the knowledge, but they never truly get saved. If you don't truly repent and believe, if you've come across this and you've made it this far, and you've never truly repented and come to the cross broken, you need to do it. Time's running out. You're not saved if you've never done it. Psalms 4.2 O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame, whose glory is in their shame? Our glory is through the, plan, the, sal, the proper plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Our glory is the new birth, the proof of salvation, the new birth, the changed life. Our glory is in our Lord and Savior. For he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay. But God hath, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and the things that are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence whose glory is in their shame, whose God is their belly, whose end is destruction, who mind earthly things. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory to shame? Verse 13, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That's the evidence of someone who's truly saved and born again. And what does this all lead to? That according to as is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I'm doing things God's way. All glory be to God. Because, you, know, you hear people say that all the time. All oh, glory be to God. All oh, glory be to God. Are you living thing, doing things God's way? Are you hiding God's word in your heart and living it? No. Then your, the, your words mean nothing. When you say glory be to God, it's because you're doing things His way. And His way is the right way. That's what it means to say glory to God. Your way is the right way. And that's the way I want. But you see here, you turn my glory to shame. How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing, Silah? But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. Repent, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And God will grab you, give you a new life, and now you're set apart for him. You belong to him. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, Silah. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Paul talks about present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and without blemish, which is your reasonable service. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's another telling of these faith, of bad fruit, if you want to say, because there's good fruit from true biblical salvation that has true biblical repentance applied to it. And there's the bad fruit of ease, uh, faith alone. And one of the bad fruits is they still love their sin. They still have no problem with it. They use the cross as a credit card. They use it as an excuse to sin, to justify sin. Now, they're not saying it's not sin. They're just justifying it. They're still, I'm saved, brothers and sisters. There's still no justification for my sin today. 
sin is still wrong, even as a saved sinner. I have to repent every day. I got to come to God broken and say, Lord, help me to do what's right. Help me to stay on the right thing. Help me not to sin anymore. Help me to be holy as ye are holy. Help me with that sanctification. We just read it here. Our, the four things. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. Help me be clean, O Lord. Help me remain clean, O Lord. All right. Galatians 6.5 says, turn to Galatians 6.5, it says, For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap to the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. How you get to, if you're saved, how you get to spend life, er, your li how you get to spend eternity. The, ju the judgment seat of Christ, where the saved get judged. How we get to spend eternity. But this also can be compared to Romans chapter 8, a a someone who's truly saved versus someone who's lost. Someone who's 100% lost, they're just sowing flesh shall reap to the flesh corruption. Turn the mind of walking after flesh. The wages of sin is death. They're just earning wages of corruption. Whose damnation is just. But in Romans 8, for someone who's saved, you're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. But he that sowed to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We still fail. We still make mistakes. But our heartfelt desire is for the Lord and we're spiritually minded. The Holy Spirit saying, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And sometimes we fail. But we still have that heart, heartfelt desire. Two steps forward, one step back. We're still moving forward. If you take two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and you keep doing that, you're still moving forward, but you're just inching. There are some brethren that are like that. And hopefully they get to the point where they're always moving forward and they rarely take a step back, but they're mostly moving forward. Okay. But when you have someone that says, I'm saved, and they're still running 100 miles an hour in the opposite direction, the wrong direction, uh, no, you didn't repent. And verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. People that attack true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation, want to sow left and right to the flesh without reaping corruption. And that's the number one reason why they, that, that Satan uses to entice these people. If I can take away true biblical repentance, then you have the head knowledge and you're deceived into believing you're saved, and you treat the cross like a credit card that you can sow to the flesh all you want without reaping any corruption. And that's the deception. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's for both saved and lost. There's still consequences for reaping to the flesh down here. Even for a saved person. All sin is neg negative. All sin is negative. Okay. Brothers Christ, true biblical repentance is not the same as when God repents. When man repents, it's not the same when God repents. There are two different types of repentance. When God repents, it's a change of mind. And it's based off of what man did. Whether man sinned against him, or whether man, after sinning, the man repents, and God repents. But God's repentance is a change of mind based off of man. Man's repent is a change of heart based off of what God's going to do to him. Right? It's a change of heart. It's not a change of mind. Right? This is true salvation. Say we get back to it, Acts chapter 20. We're going to go back a few ch uh, chapters, because uh, verses, I'm sorry. Go back a few verses because it's important. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he, he sent to Ephesus. This is the Gentiles. Time of the Gentiles. This is the, the churches that are among the Gentiles. Ephesus. And called the elders of the church. And when they were come unto him, he said unto them, Ye you know from the first day that I came into Asia. He's not preaching to the Jews. He's preaching to the Gentiles. Because they'll try to say, the, the axe rode to hell. No, he's preaching. This is after the transition. We're in the time of the Gentiles. He's preaching to the Gentiles. I came into Asia. After what manner I have been 
I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. This is a saved man. Yeah, saved people still get tempted, and yes, sometimes we do fail. Repentance continues. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't start at the before salvation, and it doesn't end at salvation. It continues on in the life of a Christian, someone who's truly saved, born again. And temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He kept back nothing. What's this false gospel do? They're keeping something back from you. If you've come across this video and you've been fooled by faith alone, easy believism, they're holding something back from you. That's what Satan does. He tells you half the verse and then adds to half the verse. It makes it all false. The gospel, you take away true biblical repentance, the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he went through on the cross ain't going to do you any good. You're still going to go to hell. You're still going to burn for all eternity. They've held something back from you. Paul says, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. In other words, Paul's saying, I kept nothing back from you when it comes to how to find God's saving grace. How to get saved and born again. Paul held nothing back. Then you get into verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, there's a lot of silence there. I had to be silent for a second because like, what else do you say? Brothers of Christ, if someone wants the truth, that's enough to lead someone to Christ who's ready, who has a broken heart and a contrite spirit. They're, they're ready for salvation. That's enough. You come across somebody that you just you tell them this a million times and it's just whoosh, over their head, in one ear, out the other ear. They vomit it back out. You know, they don't want the truth. They're not ready for salvation. And one of the biggest deceptions that Satan, that Antichrist spirit, first John talks about that Antichrist spirit is even now in the world today. Okay? That Antichrist spirit's in the world, it's already starting that deceiving where you got all these people that they prefer that faith alone gospel because they can sow, they can reap, uh, sow to the flesh all they want without reaping corruption. They can just treat the cross like a credit card and just charge everything and continue living however they want to live. Paul is saying, having sorrow towards God for your personal sins that is sending you to hell and put on the cross is necessary for salvation. You skip it, you'll never get saved. You're still on your way to hell. I have a sister in Christ. I'll Hopefully in the next few days I'll read. I keep talking about doing it. and I, I had to get her permission first. Now I have it, and I just need to get it out. I apologize. But she talks about that was the key that led her to true biblical salvation. She was always lied to about repentance. Today, brothers and Christ, everyone's being lied to about true biblical repentance. And that's why not many people are getting truly saved and born again. We've got to fight this by preaching the true plan of salvation through the Word of God. Final authority. This is the final authority. This says you have to repent. This says repentance is having sorrow in your heart for your sins. Coming with a broken heart and a contrite spirit is having sorrow in your heart for your sins that you've sinned against God. But put His Son on the cross. You never do that, you'll never get saved. Then believe in the, Once you've uh, repented, then believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Paul's not saying believe and believe. That is a doctrine of devils. And that's what this person's basically saying. Repentance is just the change of mind going from unbelief to belief. So when Paul's saying repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, you're, this man's saying, you're just saying believe and believe. And you know what call? Call doesn't mean ask God to save you. Call just means believe. So you have believe, believe, and believe. Satan's come in and he's destroyed the true plan of salvation trying to prevent as many people from getting saved as possible. Now in the end, it's that individual person's fault if they don't get saved. If they don't get saved and born again, they can't blame Satan. Because God has shown them the truth. God has opened doors to them. If they wanted the truth, 
It's there for them to have. They just never wanted the truth. If you wind up in hell with this faith, all these faith alone people are going to wind up in hell because they never wanted the truth. I got saved out of it. I know a lot of brethren that got saved out of that false religion, false gospel, organized religion. The Babel building system that compromises the gospel's goal. Hey, this faith alone gospel, we get more people in the pews, we make more donations, we make more money, and life's a lot easier when we just ignore sin and just come together singing kumbaya, and then when you leave the Babel building, you go and live like the devil the rest of the week. Speaking of P. Ruckman, there's some things I do disagree with P. Ruckman on. Once, with, uh, one of the studies he was talking about is he had this. He knew this guy that he believed was saved, and he kept saying, "I kept trying to live like the devil, but I couldn't do it." That's not someone who's saved. P. Ruckman. The reason this guy was so confused is that was an old 1950 study on repentance, true biblical repentance. And you fast forward it to right before Peter Ruckman passed away, he got gotten so indoctrinated and so destroyed by the Babel building system, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He was so wishy-washy on what repentance was. He was wishy-washy on one, one, one video, uh, prayer was required, and the next video, prayer is not required. One minute, repentance is having sorrow for your sin. The other one, repentance, ah, oh, it's just going from unbelief to belief. He got so wishy-washy by the end. He got messed up. Okay? The true plan of salvation today, the Babel building system, has really destroyed the true gospel. And Paul has their number. If any man preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. These Babel buildings love the false gospel of easy believism because the world loves that false gospel. No change life. I can sow to the flesh all I want without re reaping corruption. Just, you know, charge it to the cross. And these people get so upset because I'm shining a light on them. This is shining a light on them. You're still a dirty, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. You're not saved. You just have the head knowledge. You're not saved. And they get so upset. Remember what it says? Uh, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. They don't want the true plan of salvation. They don't have true love for Jesus, the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They love their sin. They regard iniquity in their heart. Their God is their belly. 1 Timothy, 4, 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, and some have. I believe Peter Ruckman was saved, but he started departing from the faith there towards, you know, the last set, lots, like 20 years of his life. You know, because he was in ministry for 50 but the battle building system over time got more corrupt, more corrupt, and he tried to fight it, he tried to fight it, but in the end he failed. He started compromising. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Faith alone is a doctrine of devils. I know they've said the same thing about me, but I've shown Scripture proving that repentance is part of salvation and what true biblical repentance is. All they can do is keep adding to the Word of God, saying faith alone, faith alone. They just keep adding to the Word of God, adding to the Word of God. And they say, I'm teaching a doctrine of devils, and I show where the Bible says what I'm saying, and I prove that they're the ones that are teaching doctrines of devils. But it comes down to the individual person. Are you going to truly get saved and born again? Are you going to pray to the Lord and seek the truth yourself, like I did? Like many of the brethren that are watching this do did. They ask God, open the scriptures to me and show me the truth. Open the scriptures to me and show me the truth. Second, uh, two, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. But seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. And that's what we see today. These battle bullies are pushing false gospels. And that's why... Uh, I heard a brother in Christ once say, and I, I agree with him. Not because of his words, because I've seen it now with my own eyes. The average person going to these battle buildings, they're not saved. 
They're not born again. It's just a social club. Most people that I've talked to that truly got saved and born again had to come out of these Babel building systems. Organized religion. And don't get me wrong, they're starting to do the same thing on here. Where YouTube, I'm pointing at the computer. YouTube, you have men on here that have an occult following and they're no different than the Babel building system. Okay? Hundreds of thousands of following. And they're preaching doctrines of devils. And you have someone that gets on to watch their video. Okay, I'm a Christian for an hour while I'm watching the video. Then I'm going to go back to living like the devil when I'm not online. Just like these bat... We used to say back in the day before the internet got big um, that the Bible would go, you're a Sunday Christian. You're only a Christian when you're at church Sunday. But the rest of the week you can live however you want to live because, you know... No. You're supposed to be a in Christ Christian in Christ 24-7. Every day of the week. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's serious. The wages of sin is death. Hell. The lake of fire to burn for all eternity. One of the studies I still like by Peter Ruckman, and it wasn't much of a Bible study, it was more of a, 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 a gospel message in the sense that he did quote some scripture, but he spent more of the time telling you the five surprises in hell. He was warning people about hell that it really was there. And he was trying to talk to them on their level, the lost people's level. You still need to come back to the scriptures, which he did a little bit. But we still need to make sure we're preaching the scriptures. We don't come down to the level where we just ignore the scriptures and talk to them the world's way. No, we still quote scripture to them. We still say, thus saith the Lord. He's the final authority. He says you're going to hell, you're going to hell. For the wages of sin is death. And when you look at them, and they're like, I don't care, I had the one guy that saw the magnet on my car, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to hell. He said, if you actually believed hell existed, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be happy about going to hell. Because he said it like, yeah, I'm going to hell, so what? And that's not a big deal. If you actually truly believed hell, because they don't. The people that just... that to say, hey, I'm going to hell, and they just seem to like have no problem with it, or it's, it's going to be a fun time or something, or who cares. They don't actually believe the real hell exists. That rich man that was in hell, that looked over at Abraham's bosom to Lazarus, when he was in hell, he didn't want to be there. In fact, he didn't want anybody else to go there. If, you, if he had known about hell, well, he did, but if he did, would have believed that hell was what it was, before he went there, he might not have gone there. Today, people don't understand what hell is either. Maybe we need to start preaching hardcore on hell again. that will lead people to repentance. Okay, For the wages of sin is death. Hell. The lake of fire. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the wages of sin is death. Before salvation. Because of your sins. What God plans on doing, I wanted to throw this in at the end about another way God repents, a change of mind. What God plans on doing because of sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. After salvation, change of mind. Because, our, because of your sins, God said you are worthy of hell, and that is where you are heading. But if you repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross... Confess both in prayer, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And ask God to save you, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call means ask. Only a Satanist would say call means believe. I'm talking about someone who's in ministry preaching it. A Satanist would say call means believe. No, call means ask. Ask God to save you. You can get the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, with before have been ordained that we should walk in them. If you've come across this and you're not truly saved and born again, you need to get truly saved and born again. Give your life to Jesus Christ on the cross. Throw that old man, that sinful, wicked old man. Here's the wicked old man that I am, Lord. He needs to be thrown at the foot of the cross. 
The old man needs to be dead and buried with Christ so the new man can be raised with Christ. So you can be saved and born again. And I'm not talking about cleaning up your life. That happens afterwards. I'm talking about that old man. You go to the cross saying, this is the, the wicked man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That old man needs to be thrown at the foot of the cross. You don't come to the cross saying, yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, I'm, we're all sinners. And I, I like some of my sins, and I, I, I just don't want the consequences. So, you know, I'll believe in what, what the big guy upstairs and everything, and that person will never get saved. Your heart has to be right. That's another thing. At the beginning of Peter Ruckman's ministry, it's a heart issue and it's important. There's a difference between a head issue and a heart issue. By the end of his ministry, did you believe in your head or did you believe in your heart? And he's mocking it and he's saying it's just garbage and it isn't. True repentance is a heart issue. True finding salvation is a heart issue, not a head issue. You can miss heaven by 13 inches. You have the knowledge, but you refuse to repent. You're, whole, you're regarding iniquity in your heart. What keeps people from repentance? Obadiah 1.3 says, Obadiah, 1, Obadiah chapter 1 verse 3, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. The pride of thine heart. Pride. Love of your sin and being so prideful and not wanting to give it up. Regarding it. Yeah, it's sin, but I don't care. I'm keeping it. have deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? I, I love my sin. I have no problem with my sin. But because I believe in that with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you have to save me, Lord. No, he's going to bring you down to the ground. Because of the pride of your heart. If you don't come to the cross repentant, Having godly sorrow in your heart, sorrow towards God for your personal sins, you'll never get saved. And what keeps people from doing that? The pride of life. The pride of heart. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Remember it said, the sorrows of the world work at death. When we saw that, for godly sorrow work with repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. The law of sin and death. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, they want to reap to the flesh, with, uh, sow to the flesh without reaping corruption. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Whatever it is that's in this world, if you're lost and watching this, whatever it is that's holding you back, that you're trying to hold on to, and you think is more important in this world than salvation, than coming to God broken, and getting truly saved and born again, you need to drop, say, Lord, get rid of this pride. Lord, help me with my priorities. Salvation is key, it's number one. Serving you is, is after I get, get saved, new life, I belong to you. I'm bought with the price. I'm not my own. The pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The reason I threw this in there, brothers of Christ, is because I kept asking myself, why would these people, these faith alone people, they're so, they've, they pretend like they know, they, they parrot what they've heard people say, but they act like they know the Word of God and they act like they love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why won't they repent? Why do they keep tearing repentance, true biblical repentance, out of the plan of salvation? The pride of life. The pride of thine heart. Their love of their flesh. They don't want to come broken. So they try to find some other way. Remember Jesus said, I am the door? They try to find another door to heaven. They try to find a back door. We have a study on this. Trying to find a back door into heaven. This is what these people are doing. They don't want to do it God's way. The only way to get saved today. So they try to find some back door. And these false religions that Antichrist spirits, the lowercase g God of this world, Satan, offers them a false gospel, a false back door. 
and a lot of them are taking it, hook, line, and sinker, and they're still on their way to hell. Their condition hasn't changed. They're still on their way to hell. Remember, it's not too late. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because it starts with fearing God and knowing that your sins are sending you to hell and you come to God in repentance. It starts with repentance. 2 Timothy 2.25 In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Thus is Christ, we need to come across in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, patient, apt to teach, and we need to start teaching true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. I want to see people get saved. I want to see this person that made that comment get saved and born again. Even my enemies of this, of this channel that really tear me down, I want to see them get saved and born again. I have brethren that I believe are saved that really attack this channel, attack me, and I want to see them get back up on their feet and get back to their walk with the Lord. They have such hate for their brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to see them get back on the right path. That's the whole attitude we need to have, brothers and Christ, the proper heart. It always goes back to a heart issue and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So we're not going to end this with, the goth, uh, with a, a hymn, but brothers and Christ, if you want to sing that hymn about uh, there's coming a day, you know, there's going to come a day where we're going to get called home, we're going to be sitting at the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to have to answer for our life as a Christian. Did we fight for the true biblical repentance, the true gospel, the true plan of salvation? Did we stand by this book? Did we live this book? And the lost world is going to be judged at the great white throne. Um, predominantly lost people at the great white throne. We want to see people get saved. My heartfelt desire is to see people get saved and born again. So... Uh, you can sing that hymn, pause it and look it up, that hymn, uh, There's Coming a Day. And we're going to go home someday. So when I, remember we had the verse, Be not weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. We need to have done all to stand. Make sure you're putting on the whole armor of God as you're fighting for the gospel, as you're, as you're standing for God's perfect written word. I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.